wouldn't it be hilarious if we just had no one here? Check. I think it would be so funny if we went here for 25 minutes. We were just like, what? We were going to sit and talk about the weather. Oh, that's why it says caption. What time is it technically start? Ten? Yeah. Are we here? No. Ms. Tanja Connerly, and I will be your moderator for the Universal Usability Workshop. Today, we have the honor of having Mr. Jackson Daly, UT student, PhD student, who is exploring the issues of higher education for people with disabilities. And we also have Mr. Sam Burns. He too is at University of Texas. He is a senior IT manager where his specialization, one of his specialization is also studying the usability of students with, uh, in reference to disabilities. This presentation will offer the audience a chance to understand the central ideas behind universal 
usability. And I'm sure that Mr. Jackson and Mr. Burns will define that for you. And the impacts of their design, philosophy to learn ways universal usability can implement in terms of contents or physical design. This is a short workshop, so I'm not gonna read the whole uh, introduction part about what the workshop is about. I'm gonna allow uh, Jackson and Mr. Burns to let the show roll. So Sam, I'm turning the mic over to you. Thank you so much, Tonda, I appreciate it. Um, welcome everybody. We are so happy to be here. We almost didn't think we would make it after uh, the last couple of weeks we've had in Texas. So uh, it's glad to finally be here and, and presenting for you today. I'm gonna start just by telling you a little about who I am and um, how Jackson and I came to collaborate on this particular effort. Uh, but just as Tonda said, I am uh, Sam Burns. I'm the director of IT at the School of Information at the University of Texas at Austin. And I have been involved in um, usability work since I did my graduate degree here. Uh, and as an IT professional, I became connected with and interested in uh, accessibility by virtue of web design and being the web general web developer for the iSchool. Um, and that, that led me to associations with Nobility, a group in Austin focused on um, universal design and IT. Uh, and I also was uh, a usability researcher here at the campus and worked with John Slayton at the Accessibility Institute, which is uh, closed in 2006, but was a really landmark institution in the state of Texas and in the country uh, world, in fact, uh, leading uh, research into people with uh, disabilities and how they worked with technology. So uh, it's something that I care deeply about. And for the last four or five years, I have put on workshops here at our school, um, bringing in people to demonstrate various accessibility software, um, talking to students about how to make accessible web design and ways they could think about accessibility as part of their work as designers, uh, information architects, usability professionals, user experience designers, whatever we choose to call them uh, this particular week. Uh, I wanted to make sure that their focus was on thinking about the concept of user as everyone in our society, any, any human being who may be interacting with an information system. I also um, am part of a school that just launched an undergraduate informatics program. It's gonna be, uh, it has started uh, sort of in a pilot phase and then in the fall of 2021, this year it will, it will start in earnest. Uh, and we're tremendously excited to have an undergraduate program uh, for our field at the UT campus. So we already have a lot of interest from students and Jackson and I wanna make sure that accessibility, accessibility studies, and what we're calling universal usability or is part of that particular program. Uh, so the endeavor that we're doing is to create an undergraduate course. And we wanna make sure that course is uh, OER. We wanna make sure that that course is something that other institutions could benefit from. Uh, we're a home of user and accessibility studies uh, writ large. So we're sort of a natural fit for this particular major and this particular work. Uh, and then long-term Jackson and I hope to really start making some inroads at to hopefully revitalizing the accessibility um, institute here at UT. So those are sort of our small and long-term goals. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Jackson now to talk about how we came to this term universal usability and how it relates to things you might've heard of like universal design. Hello, my friends, and thanks again for having us. So what is this uh, term? universal usability mean? Well, what it means is no matter what you're interacting with in the world, you as a user have an avenue to achieve the intended task that you're attempting to complete. Um, so simple example, let's look at sidewalks, right? If you don't have the ability to ambulate normally, there's usually a curb cut allowing you to step up onto the sidewalk and use it as it was intended. Uh, universal design attempts to address different types of user conditions um, and different uh, bodily abilities that allow them to interact with the built world. 
These seven principles that you see on your screen here are just a few guidelines we can use when thinking about something that is universal design. So let's look at the first one, um, equitable use. We just gave a brief example of that. Everybody needs to use the sidewalk, right? Uh, flexibility of use, that, that is exactly how it sounds. Uh, a user, no matter what their personal abilities are, should be able to accomplish the same task in relatively the same amount of time. Uh, this is heavily related to something like UX research, where task completion times are a heavy metric in determining whether or not uh, an interface or a product is usable. Um, simple and intuitive to use. That one is also uh, a little bit self-explanatory. So the user of any given apparatus in the built world should not be uh, struggling to figure out how to use it. It should come naturally within their field of cognition. Uh, so the simplest example I can think of is most people know how to call an elevator, right? You see a call button there, you know that if you press the call button, the elevator will come to you, right? Uh, same thing with turning on a computer. Most people know to look for a power button. Um, it's these universally um, understood type formats that allow us to build designs that are simple and intuitive for people to use. And it's important to kind of understand what those standards are and then try to build to them rather than retrofitting some sort of uh, complicated design. Uh, tolerance for error. So we're all humans and we need to be able to have a tolerance for operator error. For example, if you go to delete a file on your computer and you didn't actually want to delete it, you get a pop-up that says, are you sure you want to delete this file? That is the tolerance for error. Um, low physical effort. We don't want somebody struggling to open a door, for example, and we want to account for different levels of physical use of one's limbs. So let's say in order to make a doorway universally designed, you would want uh, doors with sensors that you see at grocery stores, for example, rather than a heavy pull door that would require a larger amount of physical effort. Uh, size, space, and approach for architecture. So this last one goes a lot into ADA principles that we know here in the United States. Uh, wider doorways for wheelchairs, um, more space in a physical room for large desks, uh, larger bathroom areas with grab bars inside the stalls, and that sort of thing. Um, now, while these principles seem very uh, intuitive and very simple to understand, they do build on a larger idea of user experience in the built world and the ability to interact with information. Um, one principle that I realized that I just skipped is perceptible information. So I should be able, for example, as a student, to download an article that I have to read and then be able to make it machine readable in order for a screen reader to be able to interpret that article. That's my way of interpreting that information. Uh, and this one really gets into the heart of this conference, I believe, because this conference is all about open resources. And when you're looking at things like information access, there is oftentimes a battle with what's called digital rights management, which is something that attempts to um, protect the copyright of authors of information or creators of systems, which can oftentimes make things less accessible inherently. So creating open resources to help uh, particularly people in education understand how to make something accessible and give them the ability to take base resources and tailor those resources to fit their particular course would be a great idea because in truth, um, education is the silver bullet to accessibility. And we'll kind of talk about that in the next slide. 
Um, so why universal usability? Uh, 3.4 million Texans uh, are considered to have a disability. What, why does this matter? What does this mean? Well, this means that they have the ability to um, avail themselves of state services, which are free to them, but which also um, you know, utilize taxpayer dollars and other government infrastructure. And unfortunately, I can tell you from my research that most of these individuals do not have a higher education degree. And so a lot of them are using these services, but they're not, um, they're not being as productive as they could be. And we're, we're misutilizing an entire population uh, because not only could this population potentially help us improve the technology we use within our society to get things done, but it would also add just plainly to the productive workforce in society. So making things universally usable, especially within the field of education, is indeed a worthwhile endeavor. And so what we're proposing here um, is to really sort of combine what has long been um, a mainstay of information schools like mine, uh, which is the study of human computer interaction, information architecture, uh, those of you who have been involved maybe in interface design would be readily familiar with the work of Jakob Nielsen and Don Norman and Steve Krug and some of the people that talk about usability heuristics and design heuristics for um, the human computer interface. So um, we would like to blend the principles of universal design with the long standing principles of of usability design uh, and user-centered research, uh, user-focused design um, to really sort of embark on a new um, endeavor to sort of combine these together and termed as universal usability. Um, so our first goal is to develop an undergraduate course. And we want this course to contribute, contribute to the creative Commons. We want to make content. This would be original module content, so course instruction uh, that we write, uh, videos we produce, both showing uh, tutorials on how to utilize equipment, interviews with um, people of varying physical abilities uh, and who may have certain we want, um, issues as users. We want to expand the notion of who a user is and who a user might be. And we wanted people to see what it is like for these users to interact in the world. How does a user with a cognitive disability approach your interface? We want to show people users with certain cognitive impairments using potential uh, interfaces, uh, low light settings, uh, color changes, all of the sort of things you have to think about depending on the user's abilities and how they meet that particular device. Um, so we want to develop content that will work for our course, but it's also something that people could pull out and use on their own campuses, in their own instruction. Uh, we want accessibility departments in every university to be able to have, have access to things, to train their faculty on how to make readings, for example, more uh, user-friendly for communities who may um, have you know, low vision or low hearing or other issues. Uh, video, all the multimedia things that um, you know we have to make better. We want to make the university stack. We sort of think of the university as a stack, a technological stack. We want to make that easier. We want to make sure that all members of society can utilize that stack um, and that the information and design of that stack has them in mind. Uh, we think that's important to education. And we think that OER is a great tool to spread this throughout the higher education community because we all, you know, those of us that have worked on preparing syllabi and course content, you know, this is not this is not easy stuff. And adding these techniques, um, facilitating these needs from a broader um, community of practice is something that takes work and it takes time and it takes know-how. And we want to make that a little easier 
to get. And we think that um, you know a typical undergrad will really benefit from being exposed early on in their formative years of studying user design, thinking about the concept of a user, uh, you know, with an awareness of users being a broad spectrum of society and thinking, you know, they're close enough to being children where they can think back to times where they were developmentally at a different point in time. Um, and they're a long way from being old where you also are aware of some of your natural um, differences that you have. Um, but we want to make sure that people are thinking about all of all of the users as they they design their particular tools. So we hope to have this course um, done in spring 2022, ready to, to go. Uh, we're submitting a proposal here at the School of Information um, for its design, so it has to get approved. Uh, but we are working currently to, as I say, prepare tutorials. Uh, we're creating video tutorials. Uh, Jackson's actually the star of those tutorials. Um, Tonta said earlier that Jackson was a star, and he is a star. He's wonderful at uh, doing these video productions. So he um is leading those but we want to collaborate with lots of other people uh, so we're doing things like teaching you how to um use screen readers to read your pdfs um how you create a pdf with uh markup and headers and other sort of information that can help a user navigate through its um particular features uh, we're demonstrating what it's like to use a a um screen reader on various course assignments for typical classes, popular classes on campus. Uh, we want to develop assessment materials that we could share. Uh, again, we want to do video interviews with, uh, you know, Austin has um, School for the Blind, School for the Deaf. We want to be able to bring people in and document their use of technology um, so that we can either drive home points to people learning how to make interfaces or thinking about information architecture and uh, also just to interact with this community of practice and talk about their needs. You know, one of the principles of design, good design, is partnering with the user throughout the design process. So one of the ideas here is that we will bring these communities in with us early on to, you know, think about how they, um, how they work with these materials. And the goal is that all of this will be made available uh, through Creative Commons licensing, and shareable in, in all of its forms, in its full form and in sort of modular pieces. And we'll distribute that through the iSchool uh, website. And then lastly, we wanna develop partnerships with other academic institutions, which is why we're here today. We wanna to work with nonprofits. We've worked with Nobility here in Austin, uh, any governmental institutions who focus on um, you know, disability uh, constituents or work with uh, you know, Texans, or elsewhere who have this interest. Uh, every corporation that has an interest in working with um, you know, the broader base of their users, we wanna partner with uh, any corporate entities who might be interested in contributing to this. Uh, Google, for instance, has some open corporate training on um, universal usability, universal design, um, and just basically anyone who has an interest in, in advancing the principles of universal usability in their particular institution. And uh, I'll chime in here just for a second to give a little more background. Uh, you know, our slide where we talk about the population this affects was just for Texas, but it's it's a much larger problem uh, throughout the world. Somebody can fact check me on this because I haven't looked at it in quite a while. But if you look at the uh, Federal Center for Education Statistics, I believe it's roughly uh, fifteen percent of the disabled population that actually graduate with a high school degree, and those numbers dip dramatically once you go to the bachelor's level and beyond. So, understanding how to craft the educational experience um, for this underserved population is not only a good idea for for universities to take up that cause, but also it will ensure that we have. Um, more of the population working and being productive and contributing their ideas into society and into the world. So that's basically the, the much broader impact of this initiative. Yeah, and there's, there's always been, you know, we, you've heard us describe this in this brief talk, um, 
intersections between physical spaces and virtual spaces. You know, Jackson talked about curb cuts and elevators. And um, one of the reasons that happens is because those, um, just as it did with usability, information architecture, an emphasis on architecture, um, is people have always thought about spaces, physical spaces and virtual spaces as having this commonality. Um, so one of the things that we hope to do just by continuing this um, tradition is again, blending these things. Again, it, it's important to point out that universal design comes from uh, an architect. I mean, these principles that we talked about in the, the second slide, those, are, uh, those were developed by an architect. Um, so the, uh, the other thing that's happening just technologically is internet of things, there, there's a, a lot of devices now that are different in modality uh, to just a screen interface. Uh, we interface with Alexa, we interface with Siri, we interface with uh, voice commands. All of these open up new avenues for new people to interact with the campus, with higher education, with each other. And that again, kicks the door open wider for people of varying abilities. So we're, we're excited to include those things in this particular a uh, rubric of universal usability. We have a couple minutes left and uh, I wanna open it up to any questions that you all might have. Uh, you'll see our contact information on the screen. Uh, we would love to have you all reach out to us. If you have a particular need or interest, um, if we could come visit you or you know of someone we could talk to about um, you know, shooting some video or uh, if you have a particular need that we might be able to highlight, we would love to, uh, we, our ears are wide open and we'd love to get your feedback uh, and we'd love to um, tailor anything we can do uh, for your particular needs. So are there any questions that anyone has? I'll go ahead and stop sharing. I was trying to observe and see if we had a hand up, but we did have a comment in the chat uh, saying that this is uh, by Morgan said, this is so cool. I'm looking forward to these resources being available to everyone. Uh, Morgan, I totally concur. Uh, Amanda also reiterated how great this project is and I would love to see the final course and resources. I think we all have that. Uh, Dr. Ryden has his hand up. David, would you like to speak? You can, I need to unmute you. Thank you, Dr. Con Connerly. Can you hear me? I can. Oh, terrific. All right. Well, thank you guys very much for this presentation. You know, um, um, you know, one of the things that I'm, I, I'm thinking about in, in the humanities anyway, um, and maybe in the social sciences as well, uh, but it's quite frequent that our instructors will use PDFs or use a standard PDF like uh, those produced by JSTOR. And um, is there an, you know, what's your feeling on those? You, you mentioned PDFs a moment ago and it was, you were talking about the importance of making sure they're uh, H tagged or tagged appropriately and so forth. But when we're working with something as common and also fundamental to these fields, um, what, what's, is, is, is there software that can sort of appropriately, I guess, strip the information and, and put it in a readable format? Sam, you want to take this one? Should I? <laughs> I'll, let me start, because this is a great question, and it's, I'll just let you know by way of introducing Jackson into this question. Uh, Sam when Jackson... And Jackson. Oh, Sam and Jackson, I'm sorry to interrupt you real quick. Now, if it shuts off, I totally apologize because the rooms are, to my understanding, have the allotted oh. time on it and we're okay. right at the time. Okay. So is there any way that I could give you, uh, if Dr. Uh, Ryden can uh, ask you that question in writing because it's so awesome. And then we can pretty much get back to everybody. If you can, you can pretty much uh, answer that question for him via email, that would be great. Absolutely. And uh, yes, you're absolutely right. It is, it is a disaster. It's a huge impediment to higher education uh, and the disability community in higher education. Um, yeah, we can talk at length about JSTOR in particular uh, and just the way journals are constructed, frankly, and the way they're OCR'd is in really problematic. So yeah, uh, that's going to be a big part of, of what we're going to talk about in our class. 
Okay, great. I want to thank you guys again. Your workshop was amazing. You're promoting exactly what Open Education Resources is about, is promoting equity. And with this form of modality that you are introducing, it is going to just take us to another level. So we're very excited. And thank you again, Jackson. And thank you again, Mr. Burns, for all of your knowledge today. Thank you guys so much. Appreciate it. Everybody else, please enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you so much for attending.